two epigraphs for this talk, and I'll just read them to you rather than putting them up there. Um, the first is from Karen Barrett's Meeting the Universe Halfway. The existence of the quantum discontinuity means that the past is never left behind, never finished once and for all. And the future is not what will come to be in an unfolding of the present moment. Rather, the past and future are enfolded participants in matter's iterative becoming. Okay, so that's the first. And the second is from Lynn Margulis. They take a small and interesting chapter in the book of evolution and extrapolate it into the entire encyclopedia of life. And I'm sure you know where that comes from, and it's just a, an example of her wonderfully out there thinking. So, so what I'm going to do is be doing a scale shift, a pretty significant scale shift here. Um, we're gathered here today to celebrate Lynn Margulis, whose inspiring work has shaped our understanding of the deep past, the far future, and matter's iterative becoming. But just for a moment, I want us to travel back in time to August 1967. The venue is rather different. It's lush and green, for one thing. Whoops, sorry here. We're at the Villa Cervelloni, the Rockefeller Foundation Research Center on Lake Como, Italy. Nineteen researchers have gathered here, invited by C.H. Waddington, the biologist, in order to brainstorm a new discipline. They call it general theoretical biology. Now, as Manuela said, I'm a literary scholar and a feminist theorist, and I'm trained in the practice of reading genres like fiction, autobiography, memoir, and essay, in looking closely for layered meanings. And I'm also a feminist scholar, hatched in the heady days of 1960s and 70s era feminism trained to investigate the connections between gender and sexuality, mind and body, the personal and the political. So I'm not taking us back to Lake Como in 1967 to trace the history of general theoretical biology or to explore how it emerged from the disciplines of biology, neuroscience, genetics, physics, chemistry, systems analysis, philosophy, and automata theory although representatives of all of those disciplines were in attendance at the meeting. Instead, I'm bringing us back to offer a literary and feminist analysis of the presentation that C.H. Waddington gave at that conference, The Practical Consequences of Metaphysical Beliefs on a Biologist's Work, an Autobiographical Note. In fact, I'm going to do a reading of just one image in that talk which is what we literary scholars are trained to do, the image of the world egg, because it's a metaphor that has absolutely fascinated me for years. Um, I have an agenda, so let me get it right out at the beginning. I want to explore the questions and possibilities that this metaphor raises if we read it from the perspective of 20th and 21st century biology and feminist theory, in particular the pivotal work of Lynn Margulis. And I'm motivated to do this by blame, okay? Yes, blame. I'm writing as part of a group of scholars who have been blamed in the nicest possible way for being ungrateful daughters, for criticizing our feminist foremothers of the 1960s and 1970s by saying that the feminist theory that they created dismissed biology. Sociologist and feminist theorist Sarah Ahmed has argued that if we critique feminism for its long-standing rejection of biology, we just haven't paid enough attention to the female scientists and philosophers of science who really were out there working away from the 20s through the 70s and 80s. Worse yet, when we argue that the work of one or another illustrious male scientist or philosopher is helpful in thinking through what matter might mean to us as feminists today, we're guilty of what Ahmed calls an uneven distribution of the work of critique, which is, after all, a labor of love. To be blunt, Ahmed charges, male writers, who are usually also dead and white, are engaged with closely, while feminist writers are not. What does this uneven distribution of attention and care actually do? 
well as his 70s era feminist, I am gladly ready to testify to the gaps in feminist theorizing of that era. Questions of race, class, ethnicity, disability, and age, as well as science, were generally absent from feminist theory of the day because it was intensely preoccupied instead with how society and culture gendered us female and limited us to our biological reproductive capacities. And certainly, Ahmed is right. Female scientists should be incorporated into the feminist story, just as the tale of second wave feminism should be and is being rewritten to include the black, Chicana, and Asian American feminist movements of the same years. And yet, even if we extend our attention to previously marginalized women or marginalized feminist perspectives, current feminist scholarship suggests that we won't do justice to the dynamic assemblage of events, people, places, and phenomena characterizing any era, as long as we continue to cast our net narrowly around the human. Instead, I'm arguing, our attention and our love must draw us beyond the realm of the human into the dense world of non-human materiality. And I'm quoting here. Materiality is a rubric that tends to horizontalize the relations between humans, biota, and abiota. It draws human attention sideways, away from an ontologically ranked great chain of being and toward a greater appreciation of the complex entanglements of humans and non-humans. And that's a quote from Jane Bennett. Um, that's my agenda here, then. I want to draw our attention sideways. Sideways and probably given the wonderful last talk, sideways and in, down, scale-wise, um, to explore how the Second Cervelloni Symposium, which is a site seemingly very far from the hot zone of feminist theorizing, contained in it an awareness and even a brief appreciation of the complex entanglements of humans and non-humans that are now invigorating feminist new materialism. But first, theoretical biology. Whoops, sorry. Most of us are probably familiar with Conrad Hal Waddington, a true 20th century polymath whose research publications spanned paleontology, population genetics, developmental genetics, biochemical embryology, and theoretical biology. His commitment to interdisciplinarity was so strong that orthodox biologists found him irregular. So even while celebrating him as the last Renaissance biologist, Fellow biologist Jonathan Slack scoffed at Waddington's career trajectory in 1972 as he wrote, no modern funding agency would allow any individual to undergo so many changes of interest and direction. The son of a tea plantation owner and the nephew of a naturalist, Waddington would become Fellow of the Royal Society of London and ultimately head one of the largest genetics departments in the world. But a renegade spirit leavened Waddington's class and gender privilege, and it shines through in his Cervelloni talk. He be begins that talk by admitting, I am quite sure that many of the 200 or so experimental papers I produced have been definitely affected by consciously held metaphysical beliefs, both in the types of problems I set myself and the manner in which I tried to solve them. These beliefs, he says, date back to a summer tutorial in chemistry that he took with the brilliant E.J. Homeyard, whom he was able to coax toward more esoteric studies of the Alexandrian Gnostics and the Arab alchemists. Thanks to that tutorial, he wrote, two ideas infiltrated into my thinking at a very early stage without much benefit of academic dignity, which have remained there ever since. These metaphysical beliefs, he explains, were contained in two images. The first image, and now I'm quoting Waddington's description of it, is the world egg. Things are essentially eggs, pregnant with God knows what. You look at them and they appear simple enough, with a bland, definite shape, rather impenetrable. You glance away for a bit, and when you look back, what you find is that they've turned into a fluffy yellow chick, actively running about, and all set to get imprinted on you if you give it half a chance. Unsettling, even perhaps a bit sinister. And he goes on, but one strand of Gnostic thought asserted that everything is like that. 
The second image of a metaphysical belief that Waddington said grounded his research was the Ouroboros, the snake eating its tail. I'm going to come back to this image later, but for now, I want to step back to ask what such evocative images, metaphors really, are doing at the Second Ceremony <coughs> Symposium. Recall that the symposium participants had been brought together to formulate the properties of a new field of general theoretical biology, a discipline that they hoped would have the precision and academic status of theoretical physics. Waddington felt there was an urgent need for this intervention, as he explained in Nature the following year, and I quote, theoretical physics is a well-recognized discipline, and there are departments and professorships devoted to the subject in many universities. It is widely accepted that theories of the nature of the physical universe have profound consequences for problems of general philosophy. In contrast to this situation, he writes, theoretical biology can hardly be said to exist as an academic discipline. Well, in her contribution to the third culture, Lynn Margulis tells a wonderful story of Richard Lewontin speaking to an economics class at the University of Massachusetts. As she recalls, he engaged in a kind of neo-Darwinian jockeying, detailing the Fisher-Haldane mechanisms that produced evolutionary changes, mutation, emigration, immigration, and the like. When she asked him why none of the consequences of the details of his analysis had been shown empirically, and why his elaborate mathematical model was devoid of chemistry and biology, she recalls that he responded <coughs> enigmatically, P.E. What could he mean, she thought? Population explosion? Punctuated equilibrium? Physical education? No, he replied. P.E. is physics envy, a syndrome in which scientists in other disciplines yearn for the mathematically explicit models of physics. Well, Waddington's argument certainly reveals that P.E., physics envy, lay behind the Cervelloni Symposium. However, there was surely also a P.E. of another kind, philosophy envy. To this one-time student of metaphysics, the notion of creating a discipline of general theoretical biology seems to have appealed because it would cause even philosophy to sit up and take notice. Now, admittedly, in the worlds of feminist theory and literary criticism, the phrase general theoretical biology would seem to designate a field that's inherently philosophical. After all, the word theory is drawn from the late Latin for the Greek word theoria, contemplation, speculation, and from theoros, spectator. But as mapped by the members of the symposium and as put into practice in the years that followed during the ascendancy of molecular biology, theoretical biology referred to an approach to biology that was mathematical, mechanistic even, and instrumental. And even today, theoretical biology usually refers to biology employing classical mathematical analytical models, often explicitly inspired by theoretical physics, statistically based models, and intensive computer modeling. Now, according to Massimo Piliucci, there's also, however, a fourth type of theoretical biology, which does consist of speculative, contemplative theorizing, and includes visual models like those preeminent in molecular biology. If we look more closely at Waddington Cervelloni talk, we will see this fourth mode of theoretical biology in evidence, even as he's laying the groundwork with the first three modes for the heavily quantitative epigenetics of today. After appearing briefly in Waddington's talk, however, this fourth kind of theoretical biology disappeared from the second Cervelloni symposium. It went dormant. And it reappears, I would argue, in the work of Lynn Margulis and is finally reincorporated as part of the theoretical apparatus of feminist new materialism. Where did it come from in the first place? Well, Waddington has told us about the foundational importance of that boyhood, boyhood tutorial with Homeyard. But of course, in addition to that, we can look to the work of Alfred North Whitehead. This philosopher of systems in the process of becoming was inspiring to Waddington an embryologist in the process of becoming <coughs> developmental biologist, because he was drawn particularly to Whitehead's notion of system, process, and the creative advance into novelty. In the 1930s, Waddington had begun to believe that biologists needed a theory to explain the relationship between the complete hereditary information of an organism and the organism's actual properties, 
development, morphology, and behavior. And by the way, this slide is from the Strange Ways Research Laboratory in Britain, where Waddington was doing some of his work. Such a theory needed to account for the relationship of phenotype to genotype, not only at the cellular level, but also at the level of whole organisms and even of populations. Waddington coined the term epigenetics to describe this new branch of biology, which studies the causal interactions between genes and their products, which bring the phenotype into being. And he created this classic visual depiction of a set of developmental choices that's faced by a cell in the embryo, which he called the epigenetic landscape, a schematic image of the way these relations could shape and channel development over time. And I'm quoting Waddington now. In the late 30s, I began developing the Whiteheadian notion that the process of becoming, say, a nerve cell should be regarded as the result of the activities of large numbers of genes, which interact together to form a unified concrescence. In particular, Waddington acknowledges his debt to Whitehead's <coughs> concepts of concrescence, the coming together of the constituent factors in an event, and prehension, the way an event here and now incorporates into itself some reference to everything else in the universe in accordance <coughs> with its own subjective feeling. But an aspect of Waddington's response to these ideas that was revealed during the Cervelloni Symposium would curtail some of the broadest implications of his understanding of biological development, I mark you. An aspect of his response would curtail the broadest implications. It's a question of affect and alterity. Let me explain. In his response to the world egg metaphor, Waddington admits to finding unsettling, even perhaps a bit sinister, the idea that things have a propensity to emerge, to act, and to form a constitutive attachment to the experimenter. Because, of course, this is what the fluffy yellow chick does in his image. It hatches from the world egg, runs about, and may even imprint on you if you get, give it half a chance. Well, why does this bucolic image seem unsettling? My hunch is that Waddington recoils from the mutuality of life. He resists the implication that the chick is changed by their encounter. Perhaps he intuits that the interaction goes both ways, and that the human being, too, can be changed. And this brings us back to the Ouroboros, the second image in Waddington's talk. As he explained in his talk, this famous symbol expressed the whole gist of feedback control almost two millennia before Norbert Wiener started creating about the subject at MIT and invented the term cybernetics. In fact, when the final version of his Cerebellone talk was published, Waddington included this drawing that he had made when he was still a schoolboy in 1923. And he wrote of it, I reproduce it because you will see that inscribed within the Ouroboros is a third subsidiary notion, the one, the all, a phrase which implies that any one entity incorporates into itself, in some sense, all the other entities in the universe. Well, reading this image deeply as a literature scholar, it suggests that the proliferation of life across the entire non-human realm is what Waddington finds unsettling. The notion that this mutually changing interaction extends to include all of the other entities in the universe. I believe that's why, in his talk, he first asserts that the world egg infiltrated his word, his experiments, and then, in what is really a classically Freudian act of negation, because remember, Freud wrote, anything may be said on the condition that you then negate it. Okay? He denies the Whitehead Whiteheadian metaphysics he himself has associated with it. And he says this, privately my own thought runs along similar lines, and I think they may be extremely important to the way in which one behaves in one's whole personal life, but I do not see they have had any direct influence on the way in which I've conducted experimental work, which is the subject we're discussing here. So the inconsistency that I'm identifying in his response to these two images can be found in Waddington's experimental re scientific research as well. He was attracted to the notion that an algorithm could be generated that would predict the parameters within which an individual would develop in its environment. And yet he was also deeply attracted to the metaphysical implications of the metaphor that so unsettled him. Epigenesis and the epigenetic landscape were Waddington's ways of expressing the Whiteheadian understanding that the very materials that scientists studied were actually processes 
changing in relation to their surroundings all the time on micro and macro levels, and in turn, always changing them. The understanding that emerges is ongoing, embedded, and most importantly, mutual. And yet these concepts of epigenetics and the epigenetic landscape, however philosophically framed, were also deeply quantitative. Waddington acknowledges and explains that inconsistency, and I quote, after all, I'm a biologist. It is plants and animals I'm interested in, not clever exercises in algebra or even chemistry. The garden path has its associations for the likes of us, and all of us who want to understand living systems in their more complex and richer forms. However, since I'm an unaggressive character and was living in an aggressively anti-metaphysical period, I chose not to expound publicly these philosophical views Instead, I tried to put the Whiteheadian outlook to actual use in particular experimental situations. Well, certainly that aggressively anti-metaphysical attitude helps to explain why Waddington didn't take on the fully Gnostic implications of his world egg metaphor. Ambivalent oscillation between love and fear seems to have been the affective load of the world egg for Waddington. Although he affirmed the philosophical position that beings were not autonomous, autonomous entities, but instead entangled processes, he resisted the other half of the proposition, that the experimenter was also entangled with and always changing in response to a range of things that was literally without limit. From our perspective in 2012 then, the world egg metaphor represents a remarkable node of condensation. It not only represents the relations, relationships between space and time, individual and environment, genotype and phenotype, that were of interest to Waddington philosophically, but according to Waddington himself, it also generated the core experimental concept that, to his view, explained these relations, epigenesis. More than that, it represents epigenetics at its most liminal, poised between the eras of embryology and molecular biology, and between computational and contemplative theoretical biology. So, affect and otherness. What might it have meant for himself and for biology more broadly if Waddington had been able to affirm the aspect of the world egg image that he negated? If he had accepted the possibility of engagement with the creature that hatched from the egg, rather than shrinking from it as unsettling and sinister? Another participant in the Cerbelloni Symposium gives us a perspective that might answer those questions. The only woman at the symposium, except for the secretary, and the only philosopher, Dr. Marjorie Green. As Waddington himself once said, the outsider sees most of the game. Green's description as an outsider of the symposium offers a glimpse of what is lost when the affective and reflexive potentials of scientific research are ignored. Describing herself as a kind of ethologist, or epistemologist, she puts it, <clears throat> watching the conceptual behavior, oh sorry, I'm gonna stick there for a minute, conceptual behavior of the other animals, Green diagnosed the symposium as suffering from a clash of paradigms in the Kuhnian sense. One biological paradigm was orthodox and relatively restricted and restricting, and the other was heterodox and comprehensive. And despite the claim of another participant in the symposium, David Bohm, that his metaphysic process assimilates and explains the truncated metaphysics of orthodox biology and physics and computer science and psychology, to Marjorie Greene, three crucial elements were missing from the group's attempt at biological theory building. A concept of act, that is, of creative change of order, an alternative to the thoroughly functional approach shared by all of the symposium, and a strategy for apprehending emergent orders that focus not on manipulation of means, but on understanding. Savvy of the social context within which even biological theorizing takes place, Green explained why these elements had been omitted. Temperamental reasons, the passion for model making, and social re reasons, the prestige and power granted to machine makers in our society. But reasons aside, the omission was still devastating. 
as Breen summarized it, to cut off mind from nature is to cut off subject from object so sharply that science itself, the product, after all, of subjects, becomes irrational and reality meaningless. Science becomes computation for the sake of prediction, for the sake of computation, for the sake of prediction. Well, we know all too well what happens to the insights of outsiders. Marjorie Greene's critique of the Cervelloni Symposium fell on deaf ears. Waddington dismissed it with a brief joke. I have to tell you, Waddington is my hero, so I feel really bad when I read his dismissal of it. Um, and responded instead only to the comments of David Bowman. Green did not return, perhaps she wasn't even invited, who knows, to the final two symposia. However, I think her contribution had been made. She diagnosed the act of exclusion that would shape developmental biology for a long time. What made Marjorie Green able to make such a clear-eyed diagnosis? As a philosopher of biology, she was as awkwardly placed in her discipline of philosophy as Waddington was in his. I've always been a maverick in philosophy, Green recalled, when at the age of 92, I think it was, she wrote A Philosophical Testament, her wonderful book. Ta she said, I've been taken most of the time, I have taken most of the time, unacceptable minority positions, and, and also, as women so often have been, totally outside professional life for many years. She was a zoology major at Wellesley College, and then she went on to attend Heidegger's lectures in Freiburg as an exchange student. Then she earned her PhD, her MA and PhD at Radcliffe, and as she put it, as close as females in those days got to Harvard. Even, indeed, she says, when I had passed my final orals for the doctorate, I was told, goodbye, you're a bright girl, but nobody gives jobs to women in philosophy.